Hello, I'm Joseph Kassa, and today I'm going to talk about 50 years of experience in homebrewing software for amateur radio. Give me a moment to share my screen. Some of the takeaways I'm going to talk about are the lessons learned from over 50 years of experimenting. When you're homebrewing software, it's fun, it's educational, it's good for your career, and it doesn't need parts. You don't need engineering tools. You don't need to cut holes in metal. You don't need to know which end of the soldering iron to hold. You don't need test equipments, but it could use some interface standards as I'm gonna talk about in a little while. The other lesson is computers do what you tell them to do, not what you want them to do. I still remember the first program I wrote in BASIC that did exactly that. Tables and state machines are powerful techniques. If you don't know what that means, I'll explain it. Software needs test points just as much as hardware, and you don't see too many of them even in professional software. And you can share your projects with interested parties. They don't have to go out and buy parts. They don't have to build anything. They can just install your software on their computer. When I moved from England to America in 1970 to help the Americans out with their space program, I ran into digital logic. I started thinking about using digital logic in amateur radio. And I'd been interested in RTTY. So one of the things I thought about was programming a self-operating radio teletype contest amateur radio station. And I wrote it up as a concept and showed some of the logic and how to do it. And it was rejected by the ARRL for QST as being too imaginative. I eventually got it published in the RTTY journal in three parts. And I ended up building it a few years later when microcomputers came out. When the Apollo program ended, I needed a new job. So I moved down to the Washington DC area and started working at ComSat. And there I got my hands on an 8080, an 8-bit machine. It had an editor and assembly language compiler. Now it took 10 minutes to load the editor and 20 minutes to load the compiler. So I really had to think about what I was doing before I compiled it. And so that got me into the habit of thinking before I wrote. It was a teletype IO device and it was slow and noisy. Paper tape was the only storage mechanism that we had. So there was a punch on the teletype and a reader on the teletype. Eventually we bought a paper tape reader, high-speed tape, paper tape reader, a glass terminal, ADM, a line printer, floppy disks came later, and basic came even later. And that's the machine, and you could start and stop the program and set breakpoints and everything in hardware and burn your memories and, and build embedded code. But you could have fun with it as well. So I started using it in amateur radio. I started using it for logbooks. I built an S100 machine. I used it for Morse code and used it to calculate orbits of Oscar satellites. Back in those days, we were publishing the equatorial crossing times and locations in the AMSAT newsletter. I was the one who provided those printouts. And using it for RTTY, instead of having the, the mechanical teletypes, we had it in those glass screens, or the S100 machines, and we were using files instead of brag tapes. It really worked very nicely. And I wrote that up in microcomputers in amateur radio. That's what the S100 machine with the front panel looked like. They were hexadecimal, not binary displays. And so you could actually see where the program was looping in memory by the display on the screen. And you could set and examine things going on in memory as well. You didn't need an embedded tester, well, we didn't have any at that, that time. One of the things I wanted to do was work a clean sweep in the sweepstakes contest. Now, this is where the computer program is a tool to do a job. Anytime you write some software, it's a tool to do a job. So the goal was to work all the sections in the sweepstakes. Now, my profession was systems engineering. And so I used a systems engineering approach. So I defined a goal develop an understanding of the factors involved in the sweepstakes contest so I could work all the sections. I would do that by developing a simulation of the 1977 iteration of the context in the form of a game. 
Now, the problem had been recognized at least 12 years earlier. This was 1978, by the way. And there was a cartoon in QST. But Jeeves, it's supposed to tell us where and when to find our missing multipliers. So it wasn't that imaginative, as the editor of QST told me. So again, understand the factors. The keywords are in red. Understand them well enough to enable an operator in Silver Spring, Maryland to contact all the sections, that's the multipliers, given the constraints of low radiated power and simple wire antenna. So you start thinking about the contest. Well, what do you do in a contest? The contest starts, you contact somebody, you exchange the data, you store the data, and then you might take a timeout or not, as the case may be, and you go through that loop until the contest is over. Contest is over, in this case, 24 hours of operation, elapsed time or end of time GMT, as it was then. When you're calling CQ, you stick on one frequency and you let people call you. You call CQ, 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 W3 stroke G3 ZCZ. Actually, I was G3 ZCZ stroke W3 calling CQ. And there were some people who told me that a contest wasn't open to English stations only stations in America, I had to explain. Nobody calling. So what do you do? You call again or you tune. One station calling. If it's not a duplicate, then you make the contact. If it is a duplicate, you tell them before. If more than one station is calling, you pick the right one. And then you deal with QRM due to changing conditions or other reasons. And then you can tune around. And when you're tuning around, you will hear people in QSOs, you will hear people calling CQ, you will hear noise. And you at that time, you would hear stations in South America calling in for phone patches or the BBC or some of the other commercial stations in the shared area of the band. So I started to write it in basic, but using the teletype IO, it was very clumsy to use and everything was single lines. And so I'd have to look back through the paper. It wasn't very user friendly in that format. So one of the lessons I learned was technology constrains the decisions and, and the way you implement things. Because a few years later, I was a few years, quite a few years later, 30 something, I was able to reprogram it in under Windows in Delphi, and I could put in static displays, I could show the sections and as I heard them and worked them, it would change, they would change color. And so you can see in the display here, I've worked most of the sections, I've heard them all and I'm still coming into the end. There's a, an area there that shows you what's going on on the band and the various buttons for doing it. And one thing I'm proud of is that it was for left-handed or right-handed people because you could move the section display from one side of the screen to the other, depending on how you set it up. It was nice to use, but it was boring. There were no sounds. It was not real time. But the goal of understanding what was happening in the, in the sweepstakes was what I really wanted to do. The software was a tool to help me understand it. That's sort of the difference between hardware and software. In hardware, the hardware is often the, the end. You're building a radio or you're building an amateur radio station. And that's what I found in hardware. The goal, my goal was to build the hardware. I'd build the radio, I'd play with it for a little while, and then I'd lose interest. But software is a tool to let me achieve something. And because my goals keep changing, I keep modifying the software. In 1981, I moved to Israel. A friend of mine came back from the US from a visit with a PK-232, and he asked me to teach him how to use it. Loaned it to me. I played with it for a little while, and then I sort of figured no way I could teach him how to use it. But what I would do was write him a front end that would help him use it. And so I did that. That became PK-232COM, which became Landlink. Once I had the computer there, I thought about automating the QSOs. And with mTOR, that was real easy, and even with Packet and Pactor. And so the computer worked DX in countries I never heard because I left it running overnight. I'd come down in the morning and look and see who it worked. I had one QSO with a station in India. It was one message a night and I'd send a file. He'd send me a message the next day and I'd send him one. And that lasted about a week. When you automate QSOs, you can build a little machine. 
here's how that happens. You think about the logic. A question I was asked quite often when I first came to the US is, what's an Englishman doing in this country? And you can see there that I can break that up into what Englishman doing this country. And, and so I can go from what I call states. Zero is just waiting for the first word. What I recognize, move to state one. And then if I see Englishman, I can move to state four and so on. On the other hand, after the what, if somebody says, what is systems engineering, I have a totally different set of states. So I can combine that in the logic flow and you can see it looks something like this. So if after the question what, the word systems come up, I go one way, Englishman comes up, I go the other way, or if other words come up, I go to other paths. And this is a very powerful tool because the state functions when I change state, I can do nothing or wait for another, in other words, wait for another word. I can send a file. I can turn the transmitter on and send a file. I can send a file, turn the transmitter off. I can execute a program. I can overlay a new state table. And a state table looks something like this. State, what? Don't do anything, but move to the next state. Systems don't do anything, just move to the next state. In state two, I would do something else. In state four, I would something else. When I get into state six, after the word, and I recognize the word country, I would send a file, move to state seven, the country file is country.txt, and so on. And I could allow repeats or not, depending on whether I'm holding a conversation or not. So I could build a machine that would hold a conversation. And I wanted to do this later uh, in, in packet radio on, on a VHF or a UHF network so that somebody could communicate to my station and I could have a course in it or a load of useful information that they could access about amateur radio. But the internet took over and I didn't need to do it, but I still built it eventually. And I also used this professionally, the state machine idea when I worked in Israel and we built the controls system for the world's first solar fueled electricity generating system there were these masses of mirrors and when i joined the company they wanted to use a microcomputer to do it and it was a startup company and so by using the state machine concept and a couple of other techniques i saved the country at least six hundred thousand dollars because they were going to use a mini computer that was three hundred dollars a $300,000 a pop. And I did this with a, a $1,000 microcomputer. And I went on writing more software for amateur radio, record keeping, logging. I put digital slow scan television into Landlink, used it for contests and a little bit more simulations and modeling. And then I went into satellites. Well, I've been in satellites in AMSAT for many years for tracking telemetry to code display and analysis. And again, I wrote that up in another book. And these books are still available used from Amazon or A Books or eBay every now and again. And I've got one or two for sentimental reasons. When I started using it for contest logging, really easy, you see a typical log, just like you would have in a log book. But when I started doing this, there weren't too many people using logging and the benefits were really good. I could check through the log very quickly to see if I'd worked a station or a prefix or a country. And that was fun. And I played around with contests and not seriously to win other than that. I, want, I didn't want to win that sweepstakes. I just wanted to work all the sections. And so I built some contest features into Landlink. And one of the features was I could have a contest log open and a secondary log open for the station. And so when I dug this slide out, I realized that back in 2001, I'd been sitting at my desk at the University of South Australia, and I realized the sweepstakes weekend was just finishing. And so I accessed the W4MQ remote station over the internet, and I managed to work 15 stations. And this was fun because 
I had to anticipate the delays over the internet because I'm in Australia and the station was in Virginia. And so I had to start talking a little sooner than the other station was finishing. Dean and I sent in an entry. The other contrast operation that I did was I watched Landlink work the RTTY contest one year. There was no unattended operation allowed. I sat there, I watched it, and it worked a few stations. I sent in an entry, and I mentioned that I had used the computer, and the computer had operated the contest automatically, and this is what had been rejected by QST all those years earlier. And from then on, there was a change in the rule in contests that automatic contest, automatic contest operation was not allowed. So I think I may be the only person who has legally used automat an automatic contest station, at least for the ARRL contests. Remember that state machine, what is an Englishman doing in this country? I wrote that software. I was doing my courses for my doctorate. And in one of my classes, the instructor was a ham. And he let me build, he let me build the software to actually demonstrate that. So I did it. I then incorporated that in, into Landlink. So if you get hold of a copy of Landlink from my website, you can actually see all this in operation. I'm interested in decoding and displaying Oscar telemetry, or though I was then. And every satellite used a different digital downlink format. And so you needed different programs to decode and display the data. But when I thought about what was happening, telemetry comes down, we decode it as a standard set of equations for voltages, current, resistance, and states. And then we display it on pages on the computer screen in color or whatever. So could I come up with something common that could be used on any particular satellite, at least the back end of it? So I thought about what I call parameter-driven software. I, I have one routine in the back end of my program. It's called process telemetry or process and display telemetry. And what I do is I pass it the channel number, the telemetry value of the channel, the units for, to be displayed, channel name, equation type, equation coefficient, ABC from those equations before, maximum minimum value, which set the range, which screen page I want to display it on. That, and a zero means that data will show up on all the pages the column and the row, the normal color, if it changed since the last time the, te the telemetry was sampled, change, show, a cha show it in a different color, how long that changed color would last, the minimum range value and below minimum color and below minimum alarm. So for example, I've got a voltage and I want to know when it goes above a certain value or below a certain value, it can blink. And same with maximum. And then every satellite has a table of parameters. And so the software loads the parameters from the satellite table, processes and displays accordingly. So my back end is the same irrespective of the satellite. And all I need is a different front end. And I wrote the software, I called it What's Up and standard back end, satellite specific front end. And this points out to the fact that we really need standards. If all the amateur satellites use the same telemetry format, Everybody could use the same backend software. All you need to do is change that specific table in the software for that satellite. At the time I was working at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in the packet processing area. So I got a good fit. I could see what the professionals were doing and, and work out how to improve it in, in the amateur station. Here's a partial table for USAT Oscar 11. You can see the, the information. Don't worry about the details because Fuji Oscar looks pretty much the same. I then got into JT65 and FT8. The front end is really good. I can work stations that I've never worked before, but the back end, the operator interface, to put it mildly, sucks. There is so much more than you could do. It would be really nice if the people who developed these modems and the front end data exchange parts built the front end with a standard interface and left the back end to people who build the back end 
operator interface parts, just like Mo Wheatley did with PSK31. That was really nice of him. Because think about what else you can do. I first started working this after 10 contacts, I couldn't remember who I'd worked. So I'd open up the log and see, and wait a minute, the log format is not in human interface um, standard. So what I really needed was an interface to land link. So I took a look at the interfacing. So I took a look at the message formats on the interfacing and I read all messages are written using Q data stream derivatives. What the is that? Floating point precision. They're all in double precision 54 bit IEEE format. And the message is in big endian format. What is that? And then this is what's on the, the logbook message. Okay, so we start looking at that, explaining what a, a UTF-8 is. Oh, it's an ASCII thing. Okay, that's fine. And I've got a byte in there that tells me how many characters are following. And that's good. Okay, understand that. And then what about this? Q date is in Julian day number. Q time is quint 32 milliseconds since midnight. And the time string, what on earth is all that? Well, took me a while to figure it out. And so here's an example of what the message came in. And, and you've got to work out the position, the number of bits. And I could pull the bits out I could look at the my call, my grid, the exchange, the, the, the grids, and eventually I worked out what everything was in the message. But what's wrong with using something like this? Comma separated values, exactly like a spreadsheet puts out. It's so easy to see and work out what it is. Take two or three messages with a different contact and you've got everything defined. You don't even need to look at the specification. And yes, I know there's an ADF message, there's an ADF interface type 12 message for logging, but the, all the other messages are in this crummy C only format. When I came to ZCZ log, it started off as a simple log. I extracted, I then extracted the parts from Landlink and, and rebuilt them. And I added some features. I added the manual entry into the log and the ability to search on calls and a list of all the grids I'd heard and all the PXs I'd worked. It sort of evolved over time. And so when the w, when the WSJT program sends a message across to ZCZ log, it looks to see if the call has been worked. So I built what I call a band activity window that is very similar to the WSJT program, but it's got a lot more colors. So the first part of it is the, the standard message, but I put the signal strength in, in color so I could sort out the strong ones. And then at the back end, I added on an extract to, from, and grid, because I usually close it up and just show that bit, because I don't have that much space on the screen. And I can look down there and I color it. If the two shows up in green, it means it's a station I haven't heard. So if it's a DX station or something I want to work, if it shows up in green, it says, don't bother, you haven't heard it. Red is the usual, my call sign. In the second column from, it's the, stand, it's the same colors that blue is a new station, light blue is I've worked him on another band. Orange, light orange is it's a new prefix on the band. Orange is it's a prefix on the band. And in the grids, if it's a new grid on the band, it'll show up in one color like purple, if it's a new grid completely, it shows up in yellow. And then I've got the, the grids heard message. 
or the grids herd window, where you've got a list in grids in alphabetical order. And then there's the time since I heard it, the signal strength I heard it at, did this, is the signal strength going up and down, the number of seconds, so you've got minutes and seconds, and then the number of times I've heard that grid on the air. And the same thing with the call signs, you can see the different call signs and how long it's been since that call was on the air. So yeah, there's a station there I want to work. I want, I need to know how long ago he, that station was there because he may have faded away and there's no point looking back through all the scrolled data to find him if he's gone. So if the last time I heard him was 10 minutes ago, well, there's not much point in looking for him. And all these colors and what is being displayed is all customizable so I can use it at different times. And then I've got some alarms in there at the bottom because I work, I'm living in Australia and part of the problem here is finding people to work. When you're in the US and Europe, you've got a problem with interference. Here we've got the reverse problem, it's trying to find people to work. So for example, six meters opens up for a sporadic E, 10 minutes, after 10 minutes, everybody's worked everybody else. And then you'll get the next four hours, the band is open from, v from north of Australia to south of Australia. And the same two stations are calling CQ all the time. And then I also thought, I also wanted to use the, Z the DX cluster. I started using the DX cluster and found, yeah, it's a nice product, but it needs customizing because I would set the parameters, the filter parameters, and then I'd forget how I set them. So stations wouldn't show up. So I put in, I built my own. I put in a set of tab sheets and you can see some of them here. So you've got the raw information from the terminal, which is the usual DX cluster, but then I extract. And so I can show all of them in color like so, or just the FT8 ones in their colors. And I can look and see is a particular call sign there. What did that station send and so on, particular frequencies. And I've got audio alarms, so I can tell me if particular alert calls, there's a whole list there, if particular de-expeditions or something like that show up. And I work a lot of the wet class, the wet squares on FT8. And so I put in there, I can search for particular text in a call sign like slash MM and, and get an alarm and it shows up in a different color and so on. The same in, ZCZ log when I'm monitoring the, the traffic coming out of the WSJT program. And I'm also interested in chasing parks. So you can see here that that WFF is lit up in orange, which means I heard a park. If I heard a park, this program will send a message to ZCZ log which will look up in my log to see if I've worked that park. And if I haven't, I will. my computer will say, it's a new park. And so I can stop what I'm doing at this computer, move across to the radio computer and have a go at working the station. I can look at the cluster, I can extract different frequency bands from the cluster. And I've got a list there that you can see almost underneath me. And it also shows the calls spotted and the people who, spot, who did the spotting. And one of the things I like about this and what I want it for was I can go back in time. So anytime I change frequency, it will go back through all the messages that have been received and put them on the screen. And so I don't have to worry about, did I miss anything? And I've got two real-time windows and you can see here, one is set for six meters and one is a new one set for eight meters, which is the 40 megahertz band that is coming up and various other things. So on reflection, that's me as I was at the beginning of the journey. Well, back in 1970 something. And you can see me as I am now in the little window. Computers are just a tool. 
the program is the means to the end. And so when I was back in living in England for a while, and I wanted to keep track of the grid squares, I was working on six meters. I didn't write a computer program to do it. I took a printed map and colored them in and used a marker. Programming is not sitting down at the PC and typing away. It's defining what you want the software to do. You're designing it. It's working out how to do it, working out when to do it, writing the code, testing it, upgrading and modifying. It's exactly the same way you would design hardware. Except, of course, changing it is a lot more, much more, much easier. You don't have to unsolder and resolder connections. You don't have to try and fit new components into the chassis or just recompile it and test it. So how can you start? Well, you need to think about the platform you're gonna do it on. You're gonna do it on a PC. Is it gonna be Windows or Apple? You can do it for your phone. You're gonna do it for an embedded microcomputer like the Arduino or the Raspberry Pi, or you're gonna build a software SDR interface. You can get an SDR interface and then you can try changing the software and making it do what you want to do. Think about the language. You wanna do basic C, Pascal or Delphi as it is now. Some of that will depend on the availability. You can buy or even get free old compilers from various places. And just because they're old, as long as, as, long as they still run under Windows or whatever your operating system is, they will work. You write software, you can put this on your CV that you've written software, form your own company. I did that and I could write on my CV at the time that I'd written communication software. Look out for samples to learn from, modify them. When you first start working with it, learn from other people, look at the code, figure out what the code did. It's like figuring out what a schematic does. Think of a modification, make the modification and see what happens. I very quickly learned to be very careful when my code self-destructed because I wrote a subroutine call and forgot to put a return in there. So it just embedded itself all the way down through the code. And when it takes you 20 seconds to recompile, 20 minutes to recompile it, I learned that lesson pretty quickly. And once you learn to program, once you learn the, the steps of writing a program, and you've got the logic of what you want to do. You use a dictionary to figure out which words you want to use to tell the computer what to do. So in very briefly, summing up 50 years in 25 minutes is tough, but homebrewing software is fun. It's educational. It doesn't need parts. You don't need tools. Computers do what you tell them to do, not what you want them to do. Tables and state machines are powerful tools. You can transfer techniques from your professional work if you're a software programmer at work into your amateur radio station and vice versa. I didn't talk about it, but I learned that software needs test points just as much as hardware. And I put test windows into my software. And you can share your projects with your friends and other interested parties. They can run the software just as easily as you can. Well, thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. When I first proposed this talk, I didn't realize exactly how much software I had written and what I'd done. It was only after putting all the slides together and digging through my archives that I realized what I'd done. And, and the message I want to give you from that is not that I've been bragging about what I've done, it's you can achieve things that nobody else has done before if you start homebrewing software and use it as a tool to do something. Thank you very much for attending the presentation. Any questions or comments?